open, if you will, your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. We'll be reading out of the Amplified Bible. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11, 13 in the Amplified, and then we will also be quoting from the 20th century New Testament. Hallelujah. And the purpose of this is they state the, this particular passage in a way that I like with clarity, different than the King James. I will read the King James and then we'll go to those others. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11 says, <clears throat> Not that I speak in respect of want, <clears throat> for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how, uh, so everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Reading from the Amplified Bible, it says, Not that I am implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned to be content, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am. I know how to be abased and live humbly in straitened circumstances, and I know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough or to spare, or going without and being in want. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Amen. Hallelujah. And um, the 20th century New Testament, verse 11, says this, Do not think I am saying this under pressure of all, for I have, however I am placed, have learned, I love this, to be independent of the circumstances. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, today we're going to talk about finding contentment with or in life. I think a, a lot of the things that go on in the body of Christ today, uh, a, a lot of people are following after false doctrines, they're following after, you know, exciting doctrines or whatever, and it's all because they're not content. They have failed to learn to be satisfied. Are y'all here? You're going home. You don't need another car to be satisfied. Well, listen, I know Christians who spend all the money that, they, that God gives them extra to bless the kingdom with on buying stuff to try to satisfy them. And it was never intended for them to satisfy them. Listen, listen God doesn't care if you prosper. And see, so that's, that, that's the problem with the prosperity message. We didn't teach enough balance with it. We, well, balance is compromise. Balance is not another word for compromise if it's biblical. Are you here? We need to, number one, have a heart for the things of God. Somebody say, I need a heart for the things of God. Your number one heart, your number one pursuit, your number one desire is God. Y'all hear you going home. Now, I'm a, I am a response preacher. You know that, so say something. Don't sit there like a knot on the log or the fro a frog on the knot. Amen. amen? I want an amen here and there. And if you don't like what I said, say, help me, Jesus. <laughs> And if it's personal, say, help him, Jesus. I, I mean, just let me know something's going on. Other than me hearing the rusty gears of your brain starting to creak. Amen? You don't need no WD-40 on your brain cells this morning. Amen. Amen. And you just make a choice to hook up. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a lot, of, a lot of Christians are not satisfied, and they keep looking, just like when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the, the, they started looking for a way to return. They got out there in a place where they had to live by faith. Come on now. But they, they would rather not live by faith and go live in slavery because living by faith challenged them in an arena they weren't comfortable with. Hello. It's easy to live with the norm. There, there are women who live with abusive men because it's better to live with what you know than the, than the fear of living in the unknown. That's right. Lady, you don't need no man coming in beating you. I know that. My God, you're better off without him, but I don't know what I'm going to do without him. Live. That's right. Hello. Amen. And if he's beating you, call me. 
I'll show up my shepherd staff, and I'll whoop him. Amen. And I'll bring little dog with me. He'll hold him down, and I'll beat you. All right. Yeah. You're a little dog. Oh, he's, they, they said he'll take care of him. You sit on him. I'll beat him. I said, you'll hold them down and I'll beat them. No, you sit on them. Oh, I'll sit. Oh, Nathan's got to do better than me sit on them and him beat them in the face. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. All right. <clears throat> no, but when, when, what's that's that all about? They're afraid to step out. The children of Israel got out of Egypt and started saying, Would to God. And for 400 years, they cried like babies. So much so that when God spoke to Moses, he said, I have heard their cry these 400 years. Their cry has come up before me because they're in captivity and they're in bondage and they're in slavery and they're not getting out here. They're not living a joyful life. The Egyptians have all their stuff and they got to go out there and, and stomp brick and they got to make mortars and they're building big cities all for the glory of a Pharaoh who presented himself as the great almighty. And they kept doing that and they whined and complained and grumbled to God for 400 years. They get out three days in the desert and with the God, we're back in Egypt. And you get Christians who come out of bondage. They come out of addictions. They come out of the dissatisfaction of not being alive under God and get saved. And somewhere down the road, it gets a little tough. And would to God, I was back there in the world drinking and smoking dope and running around with women and have all kinds of STDs and all that kind of stuff because it's better than serving God. Yeah. Hello. You know, get drunk is better serving God. I'm going to get high today. I'm going to smoke me some dope. I'm going to get some reefer. I'm going to go from, find out in the Bible that it's okay to get drunk. You're dissatisfied. That's right. You're not content. You're letting your flesh and your soul govern the contentment of your heart. And you have to learn to, like Paul here, say that however, whatever state I am placed in, I've learned to be content or independent of the circumstances. Yes, amen. It's not easy, folks. I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't easy when they called and said, we're not going to pay for it, and you're looking at thirty to $40,000 of money you don't have. Hello? There's just no money. There's just thirty or forty thousand dollars laying around. Hello. I did not need the phone call for the flood. Not your fault. As a matter of fact, the first time this building flooded, it flooded from a rainstorm and came in the back and went out the front door. This one came from the front and came out the back door. They said it was running through the parking lot like a river because there's so much water and it was running out the doors and just running through the parking lot. The first time it flooded, I was on vacation. Got a phone call. Pastor Ed, the church is full of water. Rain and just feel <laughs> This time I was on vacation. Somebody said, stop going on vacation. <laughs> Nathan didn't want to leave, did you? He wouldn't stay down, he wouldn't stay where he was. He was planning on going snorkeling on Tuesday. <laughs> we did go snorkeling, saw two barracuda. Nathan can't had a, a close encounter of the, the wrong kind with the barracuda. About that far from his face, looking at him. <laughs> Got out of there, didn't you, buddy? <laughs> yeah, he did. Hallelujah. You, you've got to learn that there are going to be things that happen, like not everything. And this is where people come in. They'll come into the prosperity. They came into the prosperity message, and everybody's telling you you're going to have supernatural debt cancellation. You're going to give up. You're going to give to this preacher. You're going to give to that preacher. You're going to have all your debts erased, and it didn't happen. And I'll get into that in a minute. I'll tell you why. You know why it didn't happen? Because they were giving for the wrong reason. You don't give. Because, and I, I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to say something. This, this, this false doctrine. You got to give up to get blessed. You got to give to the preacher who's got prosperity. He's already got the prosperity. I think it's just fine to give the minister. It's fine. You obey God. But don't you believe for a second that just because you gave to the, the prosperity preacher, you're going to get all your debt paid off next week. 
That's a lie and a bill of goods was sold to everybody. And everybody bought into it. And I had one preacher say, I was in his meeting when it happened. He said, I was at such and such meeting. And I sat on the end row and didn't even preach. And people put $25,000 in my coat pocket that week. And I didn't even preach. Now, here's my problem with that. The only reason they gave it to him is because they knew who he was and knew his name. The guy that sat back here on the back row that worked at Walmart as a janitor on the third shift, he didn't get $25,000 put in his coat pocket. Because the way we're teaching to give up, get, get, get to the preacher, because he's anointed, and that's going to cause your money to be blessed. You know what's blessed in your giving? Number one, you tithe according to the Word of God. Number two, you give as the Lord directs. And if the Lord directs you, it's anointed if you're given to the janitor or if you're given to the preacher. Amen. 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 This other mess is it just, I, I get really frustrated when I see it hoarding up in the hands of people who go around and preach this and they, they stuff money all in their pockets and they're driving around and, you know, and, and, and building, you know, multi-million dollar homes and flying around in multi-million dollar jets and they're driving multi-million dollar type cars and all this kind of stuff and they're telling you it's because you give to them, you're going to get your debt paid off and people are giving all that money and the local churches suffer and the people aren't getting blessed. I believe in biblical prosperity. But I believe when you do it the way God says it, when you give according to the will of God, it's anointed. Whether it was to the preacher or to the, uh, to the janitor. Are you here or are you going home? Now, a lot of people were giving and they were getting dissatisfied because things weren't happening. But you've got to understand that God's plan, you know, the supernatural debt cancellation. Well, yeah. Don't mean it's going to happen next week. Now, of course, we get the test. We find the guy who gave this offering, and yesterday they got, and the next day, or before they could get out of the building, they got, the, they got their return, and they get it and testify, so everybody starts doing the same thing. You know what that is? Anybody know what that is? That's manipulating it. You've got to be careful. When it comes to money, there are three things they taught us at Raymond to watch out for. <laughs> Three things they taught us at Raymond for ministers. There are three G's, the three G's of watching out for in ministry. The girls, the glory, and the gold. You got to watch out for the girls, men. If you're a man, well, nowadays, you got to watch out for the girls if you're a girl. Anyway. <laughs> Shame on me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your heart. Are you, are you cold? <laughs> Here, here's one of our drop cloths. Hallelujah. <laughs> Get that girl warm. Hallelujah. Now, but we, we so sometimes we, we bring dissatisfaction ourselves because we're manipulated into believing certain things are going to happen in a certain timetable and they don't, and then we get frustrated and we get dissatisfied. Now, let me say something. Just because Jim Baker did what he did at PTL doesn't mean you stopped giving to the kingdom of God. People did. They stopped giving. When, when they found out they had, you know, 24 karat gold sink faucets and all that kind of stuff, people stopped giving. Well, no. Stop giving to people who are going to build the kingdoms to themselves and do, you know. Can I say something? PTL was, was, it, was not the will of God. Hello? to have a retirement community, to have their own theme park, to have everything for Christians. You know, as, as they, they tried that with Zion City up in, up in the upper Midwest. Um, who, who did Zion City? Was it, was it Branham or Lake? or Branham. Branham? Branham did Zion City? I think so, okay. You know, they would have the all-Christian community. Jesus did not say go build all-Christian community. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. And every time that happens, it, it, it gets an error. Every time we try to do that, it gets an error. Try to go build the, the you know, only, only Christian community. <laughs> you need to be with sinners, or you don't need, oh, Lord, you know, pay, pray for me, Pastor. I get another job. Why? Everybody I work with is a bunch of sinners. You're in a mission field. <laughs> Win the lost. Hello? I want a job with all Christians. What for? You can come to church for that. That's what the church is for, is to bring, come to church and get, and get ministry and built up so you can go to work with all them sinners and get them saved. Amen. Now, so a lot of things we, happen because we, we, have, we have false, false sense of what, is, what God wants for us. God wants you to prosper, but I'm going to tell you, just because you gave an offering this morning doesn't mean you can walk out the door and somebody's going to put $10,000 in your hand. I've heard preachers say that. The thousand-fold anointing is on me right now. Give, and you're going to have a thousand-fold return, you know? 
I heard one preacher say it. There's a, a thousand-fold anointing on me right now. You know where I'm going? With my money. Because the only reason people are going to give is they think that they just gave into their multi-level marketing scheme and going to get rich for the night's over. And they're wearing their bling. Hello? They talk about how much money they got. And you want that. And I'll say something. They, why do I have to do this, Lord? Those type preachers tap into the dissatisfaction of people where they're living right now. We've all seen the lifestyles of the rich and famous. We, we were watching some show the other day where they were buying, selling L.A. And they're buying, I mean, one house was, was $2.92 million, and they were going to tear the house down just because they wanted the property. And you see some of these, you see some of these houses, and go, man, and, you know, man, that'd be cool to live in that. I mean, indoor swimming pool, you know, I mean, retracting walls. I mean, yeah, that's all cool. But let's face it, folks. Most people aren't going to have that. But if you start getting dissatisfied with your 1,100 square feet, come on now, and you want that, you'll start selling out to the flesh to try to get more. And I'm going to tell you, that's not what you need. Having more is not going to do it. Having the bigger car, having the nicer house, having this. And listen, men do that with their wives all the time. They want to trade her in and upgrade the model. <laughs> they want the newer version. With sleek lines and curves, y'all here. You're going home. You don't talk about it now. You know, I mean, that old model's wore out. It's time. To, she's not a car. You can't trade her in every five years. It's not a lease package where you get every two years you got to trade them in. It just doesn't work that way. Hello, but dissatisfaction because you see something that looks better. We are. I'm telling you, dissatisfaction starts in the soul of discontentment. Amen. That, that, that move to move away from what's right and to serve God, to do the right things and to do it the way God says it starts in that soul of discontentment, whether it's financial, whether it's, it's sexual, whether it's spiritual. You'll get people coming to a church. We have people leave our church in the past and the only reason they left, they were just kind of dissatisfied with where they were at this stage or whatever in the, in the, in the growth of their church or life or whatever. They want something different. They just want something different. Hello? I got a dog. Sometimes we need to be like dogs. I got a dog that eats the same food every day of her life. We changed it one time because we, we were somewhere, didn't, we couldn't find that food, had to give her give some. She wouldn't eat it. I tried to get rid of that bag of food by feeding it until she'd go two, three days, wouldn't eat. She'd finally eat it because she got a desperation. I went by, finally went, I said, I'm going to the store, I'm going to buy her her regular food, put it down, and she liked to eat the bowl getting to it. <laughs> Amen. We are not to forget, and we're not to move away from the things that make us successful. Some people think, well, I've got enough now, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. No, 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 I'm going to tell you, you're going to need to rehearse, 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 so you can be successful. But we, we get dissatisfied spiritually. We get dissatisfied soulishly. We get dissatisfied uh, 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 materialistically. We get dissatisfied sexually or, or, or with your spouse. Folks, you get, I'm going to tell you something. If I let my wife say, you know what, I'm just going to trade you in next week, the trade would probably never take place. What would take place is the transfer of insurance money from the insurance company to, my, to the widow. Because my wife would take me out. And she should listen, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy, for your support. We found us another pastor. Hallelujah. And that, see, Paul said this. He said, I've learned whether I'm abased or abounding to be independent of the circumstances. Are you here? There's a lot of people who get a lot of money and they're still not satisfied. They just want to do it. They just want to quit the world and go hide somewhere. You just go spend their money. God didn't call you to go get money and then go hide with it. What do you, he gives you the power to get the wealth to establish his covenant in the earth. And that is, and some people say, well, that, that means they, they focus on establishing his covenant of blessing you in the earth. But I believe he gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. He gives you, he blesses you financially so you can help get the gospel out. 
Amen. And let me say something. If you, if you think that the, God, that, the, that the church should only be, it's all about just winning the lost, you're wrong. Jesus said go make disciples. He didn't say go make converts. There's a difference. The local church is supposed to grow up the believer. Amen. All I care about is winning the lost. You're wrong. I said you're wrong. The head of the church says go make disciples. He didn't say go make converts. So if all you're thinking is win them, 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 I'm just going to win them. You're wrong. God only put, wants me to put my money where I'm going to win the loss. You're wrong. The church is designed to disciple the believer so the believer can go win the loss. Did you know that 85% of people that are one to the kingdom of God are one one on one and not through mass evangelism or through Christian television or anything else? 85%. Huh. They were discipled in the church and the church went out and the people went out and won them. 85%. Well, all I care about is working at that 15%. You're working in the wrong place. Thank God for mass evangelism where it works. But I think, um, I, I know a guy a number of years ago, he was doing a bunch of stuff in the country and went a bunch of people to the Lord. But what they found out was no, nothing was happening with the follow up. So a friend of mine went with him for, for, um, for uh, 24 months or something like that and went behind him and started churches. After the Crusades or whatever, he went in and started churches. What? you got, you quote, 50,000 people saved and no church for them to go to? What are they going to do? They're going to die. What would you think if we had 50,000 people born in this country today and didn't put them in a, didn't put them in a nursery? Say, so, well, you're born, you're human, make it. No, making disciples is important. Amen. But Paul said, he said, you know, I, I, I've learned to be independent. In verse 11, I've learned in 20 centuries of independent circumstances. Verse 12 says, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I am instructed both to be full and be hungry and both to abound and suffer need. Now, I, I, I have struggled because a number of years ago I read a translation or a commentary of a translation that I cannot find, but it's just ingrained in my head ever since then. And I've looked and looked and looked and looked, and I can't find it. And it's just frustrating me because I want to find it and be able to reference it. But I, I, I was reading either a commentary or a translation that said this. He said, uh, Paul says here in verse 12, he said, I have learned that whether I have plenty, that if I have plenty, not to lose my head. Or if I have lack, not to lose my poise. What are we talking about here? Becoming, and he goes on and says, independent of the circumstances. And that is the key to finding contentment in life. Your surroundings can't govern you. Your surroundings cannot determine whether you're going to be happy today or sad tomorrow. Hello. Your bank account. Oh, listen, I'm going to tell you something, folks. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we all, we've all, have you been there? Your bank account's talking to you. Anybody had, anybody, have you ever had your bank account talk to you in the middle of the night? You ain't got no money. You broke. You going under. I mean, go on, turn hee haw on, and sing with them. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> go ahead and sing with them, boys. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair. I mean, even your, your bank account singing to you. You're in trouble, boy. You're going under. Paul said, I'm independent of the circumstances. I'm not going to lose my poise because my bank account's in trouble. Now, what was it? Then all of a sudden, all the money shows up. You've got more money you know what to do with. You don't lose your head. What do you mean lose your head? Man, I'm going to buy me a $20 million yacht, and I'm just going to float around the world. Me and the Lord. The Lord didn't call you to float around the world. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Some of these preachers that went and got all this money and they divorced their wives or they divorced their husbands and marriages broke up because they had all this money and people put 20, 30, 40 million dollars in their ministry over two or three years. Are you here? I know you're thinking, can't, no, no way. Oh, yes. There's one of these, one of these hot shot television people had to have their apartment in New York City go up in New York and film their program for the Christian Network. $20 million when the divorce started coming down. They're renting a six, seven thousand dollar a month apartment because they got to go film in New York. I'm going to tell you something. They make nice cameras and make nice studios you can put in, in wherever you're from. You don't have to be in New York City. Are you here? Hogwash. Another, another family. They got on television and hit and shot up like a rocket. She's out. He made, he made four million dollars a year pastoring. She made 20 million dollars a year as an as itinerant because of Christian television. Now I'm going to say, I, 
Well, God wants us to be blessed. I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm sorry. No preacher needs $24 million. There's no lifestyle we need when there's a world going to hell. Hello. You can live comfortably and you can live good. You don't have to live. See what happens. We, I deserve it. I had one preacher say one time, his guard dog was worth $25,000 or $15,000. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. My wife had a hard time with that statement. We have people in our church who didn't even make 15000 in a year, and he's bragging about his guard dog. Who had, it, was named, it cost him fifteen grand for his guard dog. I got, and then the people want, they didn't want the people to give to him so they can get out of debt. Well, how, what, what do you feed him? Filet mignon for dinner? <laughs> See, that's losing your head. That's right. See? You're, you're not content. You've got to go lose your head and spend super, super, stupid extravagant. Or you're so poor, you're, you're, you're or losing your poise, you, you're, or you're falling apart because you ain't got no money. See, you're not content. You have got to come to the place of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That you're content whether the money is in abundance or whether the money is in lack. You, the, the, not that God's making you lack. You understand? You can still use your faith to get out. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about that right now. We're talking about your attitude where you are. Because it'll short circuit your faith if you lose your head or lose your poise. Because what it really is is a tail. You know, how many you know, poker players have a tail? And all the time they spend when they're playing poker with somebody is guys are playing and looking. They're always looking for the tail of the other guy so they can know how to manipulate and use it against them. You lose your poise, lose your head, that's your tail to the devil. You're not in faith. And God wants you to stay in faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're not running out the extremes of life. I tell you what, God did not call us to be roller coaster Christians and live on the highs and the lows of life. We're going to be on a steady plane upwards. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, from glory to glory. We're always moving up with Him. But it's not this. <laughs> when are you happy? I got the money. When you're not happy, I don't have no money. Hello? This went right today. Woo! This went wrong today. I got relatives who get on Facebook. You can always tell. You think, oh, I mean, you know, just, just some people shouldn't be allowed on Facebook. I'm going to call their names. I, apparently, from looking at some of y'all that are friends with them, they know you know who I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm going to stop since you know who I'm talking about. Bless their darling heart and stupid head. Anyway, Paul said, I've learned. If I'm not going to lose my poison, I'm not going to lose my I've got to be independent of the circumstances. And so if you're going to find contentment in life, that's what you're going to have to do. Let's move on here. Um, Paul says this, he says this, um, in verse, his thought here is not that we're sufficient of and by ourselves, he states that. Remember that? He said, my self-sufficiency is in Christ. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. I'm telling you, when you learn to live in commun communication and in uh, connection with the Father, and you learn the secret of having that divine relationship with Him, the storms of life can come. Remember the man? who built his house. He that heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a man who digged deep and built his house on the rock. And the storm came, and the winds blew, and the flood came, and the house stood. But he who heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken him unto the man who built his house on the sand. And the storm came, and the winds blew, and the floods came, and beat upon it, and great was the fall of that house. What's the man who hears the sayings? When they, they, let, they let their life and their circumstances govern them. Paul says our sufficiency is not of ourselves, it's of God. You're not going, listen, I want to tell you something. You're not going to be rich because of you, and you're not going to go under if you're poor because of you. If you'll learn to trust God, you will always win. You'll always come out on top. You won't lose your head. You won't lose your poise. You'll always be a blessing. You'll always walk in the goodness of God.
Amen. Um, people think materialism, circumstances, and they say they, they do not produce joy, they do not produce strength, they do not produce satisfaction of life. You got Christians who are dissatisfied because of what other people say, because of unanswered prayer, because of personal failures, because of shortcomings. This dissatisfaction of the believer, depending upon the external, is to, is to, to satisfy the material, uh, internal. You cannot, listen, you understand this. Our, our life is an inside out, not an outside in. Does that make sense? If man is a spirit, he possesses a soul and he lives in a body. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, man is a spirit. You're a spirit being created in the class of God, created to look like God. You're a soul. You have a soul or have a soul, you, you, which is your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. You have a body. That's the house. That's, that's an earth suit. All right? That's an earth suit. You have a body. But we are an inside-out being. It starts in our spirit and comes out. If you try to start with the flesh and satisfy the internal, it'll never happen. It has to start in your spirit. It has to start in a spirit man who's alive unto God in communication and connection with God, and he's, he's, he's fostering that relationship, and it will bring to the outside. And you'll find out you can do without a quarter of a million dollar car. I don't care if you have one. God don't care if you have one. But I'm telling you, if you're looking to that car to satisfy you, I got a problem. If you're looking to your house to satisfy you, you got a problem. You know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, people always get big houses when they got the kids and they want to downsize to something smaller. You know, get something smaller so they don't have as much stuff to keep. You know, we, like, I, we got. We have four bedrooms in our home. I have three kids. But, you know, they're all going to be leaving some, at some point in time. They'll all get married. They'll go have their own family. They're not going to live with me. There's, I don't, I'm, I'm not South Fork. Dallas, guys. The movie, the show Dallas. Which is coming back next week on TNT for all you people who loved at Dallas with, J, with J.R. and Bobby. Anyway. Can't be Miss Elliot, though. They're dead. Anyway, you cannot satisfy a spiritual need with an external. New cars aren't going to take care of, 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 an, of an empty spirit. And when you, and many people do this, they separate themselves from the church, from coming to church, from being in church, because things, you know, and sometimes things happen in church. People that disappoint you, they're going to disappoint you. Did you know that? People in church are going to disappoint you. Pastors will disappoint you. One reason is you put them on a pedestal they can't live up to. I don't walk on water. Tried it once. I was smart enough to put my swimsuit on. Got wet. Hello. Oh, if you're really in faith, you would have done it in your suit. Yeah, maybe that's true. But I was just going to see if it really would work. It didn't work. Hallelujah. The dissatisfaction is a result of the believer depending upon the external to satisfy the internal. This is not to minimize the reality of the hurt these people feel, but rather to show and demonstrate the way for them to overcome. Paul further emphasizes this point in Colossians 3.2 where he says, Set your affections on things above and not on the earth. I'm going to tell you, if you've got your affections on everything, and material, everything's material, everything's material, everything's material. Here's, here's a good checkup point. Stop right now. Imagine that you went down to uh, the local gas station and bought a lottery ticket today. And tomorrow night on the Super Bowl, they pulled your name and they gave you, you found out you single, singularly won $240 million. And you are taking a lump sum of about 83 to 95 million. You guys have to go out of taxes. Hello. And now you got $83 million. You're just dreaming of it. What are you dreaming about doing? What dream pops into your head first? Did tithing show up first? Come on now. Or did that thing you always wanted show up first? The house, the yacht, the car, 
traveling. All and then somewhere down there, oh yeah, I'm supposed to tithe. You better and listen, not just tithing and giving. We're gonna build us a church, Pastor. <laughs> Well, you can't do it with the tithe. That's the tithe. You, can, you don't have any choice of what gets done with that. That belongs to the Lord. What are you going to, you going to build it with your extra money? No, I gave 8.3 8, million dollars to the church. That was, that's my tithe. You can build, no, that's your tithe. Are you going to give? This is a, when you start envisioning and having desires, what's first? It's all right to have desires for things as long as they're in the proper order in the proper place and I just use that because you know we can all dream about I won the lottery I got you know an 83 million dollar windfall today I am you know I can quit my job okay that's fine to quit your job what are you going to do you're going to sit around the house you're going to take up drinking to, you know because you don't have any friends anymore because you don't go to work hello what is it you're doing with all that money in your head I mean, forget winning it. Just what are you doing with your head? Because that tells you where your heart is. And Jesus says, set your affections on things above and not on the earth. Is your affection on the things of the earth? Is it on, or is it on the things of God? Is it building the kingdom of God and helping, the, helping do the work of God? Man, I'm telling you, do you know how many churches you could build in other countries with just a, a, a 5% of that kind of money? There are places in the world you can build an entire church uh, for $10,000, American dollars, the whole church. Can you imagine going out and building 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 churches in places that don't have a church? Yeah, but that, that could cost me my yacht. Oh, there you go. You're looking for outside things to bring. Listen, God don't mind if you have the yacht. He does mind if the yacht has you. Y'all here, you gone home. Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can, you know, I can do all things which strengtheneth me. Let me say this, lack doesn't bring defeat and abundance doesn't bring victory. Remember we said there, he's learned to be abased or to abound. Lack does not bring defeat and abundance does not bring victory. Defeat and lack, I mean defeat and um, victory take place in the heart. Are we going to be content and win? Or are we going to be losing our head and losing our poise and losing all the time? When you look at Paul's life, chapters 11, I'm going to stop here because um, tonight we're preaching on healing. But when you look at Paul's life, read the, the uh, 11th and 12th chapters of 2 Corinthians. You know, I've been three, you know, three days and night in the deep. For three times have I received 40 lashes, save one. You know, I mean, in, in perils often in, with my countrymen, perils in the city, perils in the country, and fasties and nakedness. He goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, Paul said, I learned to be content. I challenge you today to stop looking around you for your satisfaction and your joy and look back to the Lord and make sure that your joy is coming from the inside out. Amen. Coming from a relationship with Him. Coming from having time with Him so that... Wait, what's that song we used to sing? This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Why? It's from the inside. When it comes from the inner man, it comes out of that relationship with God, the world, you're, the, the creditor can't take it away from you. Hello? And you won't go giving it to the boat or the ship just to try to be happy. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that there's a challenge by the Spirit of God to find contentment in Jesus Christ that supersedes any materialistic, circumstantial situation that's going on around people that they can have the joy that they need and, the, and the, be sustained by that and not fall away or, 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 or go by the wayside of, of losing, uh, losing their head by too much or losing the poise by lack. They've learned to live the life of contentment in you. Thank you, Father, for opening their eyes. Thank you for revelation concerning these things. Thank you the understanding by the Spirit comes unto them now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.